Okay, this is an interview with Roger Menjes, uh, 620 to, uh, 2002 at the Division of Military and Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York. Uh, it is approximately 9.30. The interviewer is Michael Russert. Um, could you tell me, uh, first of all, your name and your date and place of birth, please? All right, my name is uh, Roger G for George. Mangus, M-E-N-G-E-S, and uh, I was born in uh, Albany, New York, at the um, one of the hospitals. Uh, and uh, at that time, my parents were living on Bassett Street uh, with my grandmother and her uh, husband. And um, I was born on uh, 5 20 May 17th. And uh, we lived on Bassett Street for about, um, for a little over four years. And then we moved to Del Mar, New York. And um, uh, there's not much I remember about Bassett Street, except that um, uh, my grandfather used to play a little game with me where he, we ran from one room to another in a circle through the house. And um, he, uh, uh, trying to catch me and then after a while he did catch me and uh, with a lot of uh, shouts and enjoyment. And the other thing, only other thing I remember from uh, Bassett Street is uh, one time when my mother asked me to go out to find my brother Don who was three and a half years older than I was. And uh, I went down to a place that uh, I knew that he uh, sometimes played around and I McCainley, uh, some yard down there with the pack, pack where they park trucks. And uh, I went through the fence there and uh, my brother wasn't there, but a couple of big kids were that scared the devil out of me. <laughs> so I ran home crying. That's for about my only remembrance of that part. Do you tell me about your uh, pre-war education? Uh, well, I uh, went to uh, uh, Del Mar grade school and Bethlehem Central High School and I uh, graduated in 37 and uh, then I went to uh, Hope College in Holland, Michigan for two years and uh, then uh, transferred to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and for two more years and graduated uh, in 1941 with an A.B. in economics. And uh, after uh, graduation, uh, I had tried a few times to get a job with a Ford Motor Company and others and uh, hadn't been able to, so I came back home and uh, got a job with the New York Power and Light in Albany as a uh, messenger boy. and. Uh, then uh, I was working there on uh, December 7th, 1941, when uh, I was sitting in the living room reading funny sheets, uh, had the radio on and heard the news about uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, What was your reaction when you heard this? Well, I was uh, angry, I guess, uh, upset and angry. Uh, up till that time, I had been, uh, I registered for the draft, uh, but uh, wasn't pursuing it at all. I was waiting, kind of, and uh, uh, I was a little, little uh, anti-war, but uh, uh, not quite a little bit anti-war. And uh, but the that rea my reaction was that I wanted to get in uh, to the service, and I particularly. It, wanted to get into a, a service that uh, uh, I preferred rather than being drafted. Mm -hmm. So I called up the uh, Army Air, Fo Air Corps and uh, made an appointment for an examination, uh, which I went to uh, on uh, December 29th, I guess it was, and uh, uh, I passed the physical. And they told me uh, uh, to go home. This is about noontime. They told me to go home and come back, say goodbye to everyone, and come back in three hours, which I did. And uh, then we uh, 
went aboard a troop train that um, went on its way to uh, Dothan, Alabama, and uh, we were uh, sidetracked many times along the way where while other trains uh, went, went, uh, went through, and it took us, I think, three days to get down there. And uh, that was for uh, uh, pre-flight training. Uh, and I think it was supposed to last uh, maybe six weeks or maybe a little longer. But uh, I suppose because of the emergency, uh, I was informed along with some others after two weeks that we were going to be go to uh, uh, primary flight training at Douglas, Georgia. And uh, so we, we started there. And uh, at that time, that was apparently a, uh, a private school that I don't know whether the Air Corps had taken it over yet or whether it was just an arrangement. They did have civilian instructors, flight instructors, but they did have. Uh, uh, upper class men who were uh, who were apparently part way through training or almost through training, so they did a lot of hazing of us while we were there, and uh, we had to make our beds with uh, the blankets so tight that they would uh, bounce a coin for a, an inch and a half or something like that, and uh, also they uh, came in and hazed us all the time and. During uh, meals, we had to eat uh, square meals unless they told us at ease. In a square meal, we uh, uh, took something in our fork, uh, uh, brought it up uh, straight up from there, and then horizontally to our mouth, and then back horizontally from our mouth, and then down vertically to our plate. And uh, once in a while, they would tell us at ease, and then we could eat normally. Um, the uh, uh, my uh, big memory of uh, of being at Douglas, Georgia, before we started our flight training, was we would be up. Uh, uh, they would wake the bugle would wake us up uh, before daylight, and uh, as we went to get breakfast, we could hear the uh, planes of the flight line uh, being revved up by the mechanics. And um, it was kind of an uh, awesome feeling uh, uh, knowing you'd be flying the planes and hearing them roaring in the background, and actually a little uneasy of feeling too. Uh, at that time, I had never been, uh, never flown before, and so I really didn't know what it was like. Why did you pick the Air Force then? Well, I picked the Air, the Air Force. I decided that I, if I'm going to be in, I wanted to be in uh, a uh, uh, one of the more, uh, I don't know whether you would call them glamorous services or what, but special things. I had uh, I either wanted to pick the Marines or the Navy or the, possibly the Navy Air Corps or the Army Air Corps. and. Uh, I had to make a fairly quick decision, and I wasn't know, didn't know whether I could get in the other services, so I uh, took the Army Air Corps. And um, uh, the, uh, we, we started our, our flight training and at Douglas, Georgia, in the PT-13, PT-17 uh, primary trainers, which were uh, two-wing jobs and uh, with dual controls and uh, I had an instructor by the name of Mr. Schlutt. Uh, he was a civilian instructor and apparently had uh, where I believe had worked there before uh, uh, was taken over for for Air Corps training. Uh, the uh, we uh, we flew in the planes, and uh, the, our first uh, <clears throat> our first uh, barrier was to uh, solo, and uh, Mr. Schlunt had three uh, aviation cadets, including myself, and uh, 
One of them, uh, Robert Holmes, soloed at eight hours, which was about the time that uh, the uh, hot shots were able to do it. But uh, I wasn't even near soloing at eight hours. And the, uh, I went to nine hours and 10 hours, and I was beginning to wonder whether they were ever going to tell me to let me solo. Finally, at about 12 hours, uh, I finally, Mr. Schluck told me to, okay, take it up. So uh, uh, it was very nice to be able to take it up alone and, uh, and fly it around for a little while and then come in for a landing and uh, not wreck the plane on the end, landing. And uh, so from that time on, it was a matter of uh, learning to fly uh, uh, formation and learning to fly uh, uh, various maneuvers, uh, snap rolls and loops and so forth, and uh, also learning to uh, uh, find uh, emergency fields if you, in case of uh, the motor did stopped. And uh, so from then on, uh, we uh, got along pretty well and uh, uh, finished the uh, training there and went on to uh, uh, Sumter, South Carolina, Shaw Field, and uh, we uh, then were in a little larger and more powerful plane, uh, BT, uh, oh, BT 13A, or I believe it was, and uh, which was a low, low-wing monoplane, and uh, uh, I, the the uh, chief thing I remember there was a. Uh, first night flight and uh, I'd already uh, already soloed some time before and uh, it was my first night flight the instructor and I the instructor took off and uh, then uh, had me fly it a little bit and then he came and uh, landed the plane himself and then he got out of the plane and says okay you can take it up and I thought to myself what do you mean I could take it up I haven't even practiced taking off and landing this thing yet. And, uh, but I didn't say a word. And uh, so I uh, uh, took it up and uh, flew around a bit at night. And uh, after about uh, 15 minutes, uh, I came into the traffic pattern and tried to call the, uh, the tower to get landing instructions. And there's a lot of static uh, noise on the radio and I couldn't hear a thing. So I uh, kept on going in the pattern and uh, then got on the uh, landing leg and was letting down and still couldn't hear of anything. And as I was flaring out to land, I saw ahead of me a red light and uh, that kind of alerted me and it was coming from the tower. And uh, just at that point, I heard through the static, uh, 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 you're landing the wrong way. Take off and or, uh, go around, go around. And so uh, I uh, pulled back on the stick and uh, saw some lights coming toward me from another plane and pulled over the top of him and uh, uh, got up to flying at altitude and uh, my legs were chattering on the uh, pedals and I had to settle down a little bit. Then I finally came in and uh, landed the right way, and uh, walked up to the walked up to the tower and checked in and expected that I would be bawled out for it. But uh, they didn't say a word. They accepted my explanation, and uh, that was the only uh, interesting thing that happened to me during basic. Uh, it was just uh, uh, learning a new, more powerful plane and and learning more maneuvers and. Uh, practicing landings and also doing some instrument flying. From uh, basic I went to advanced at um, Moody Field, uh, Moody Field, Valdosta, Georgia and uh, flew uh, AT-7s which were a, a single wing uh, plane and AT-9s, which are also, I believe, similar to AT-7s. And we also flew um, 
AT-17s, which were two-engine uh, training planes. And at that time, uh, we knew, or I knew, that I was scheduled to go into uh, uh, bombers rather than fighters. And I believe that uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the decisions they made uh, in putting me into fighters was that I was a little taller than uh, fighter pilots usually were. So uh, uh, advanced training uh, went reasonably smoothly and uh, with no uh, no uh, problems at all. And uh, after advanced training, I was sent down to uh, McDill Field in Tampa, Florida, uh, which then was uh, 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 training for B-26 bombers, uh, to where two-engine, two-engined uh, bombers um, with rather short, stubby wings, and uh, uh, were at that time considered uh, fairly fast, hot, hot. Uh, uh, small bombers, medium bombers. So uh, uh, at at, um, at McDill Field, the uh, the atmosphere was uh, one of uh, big, very much caution. Everybody seemed to be uh, afraid of the B-26. When we <clears throat> before we took off, uh, we everybody. Uh, examined the uh, the plane very carefully and uh, then we would take off and um, uh, in flying the B-26 uh, instead of uh, uh, racking it up uh, and, and a steep back when you were turning uh, everybody just did it very uh, shallow backs because they were uh, there was a rumor that uh, B-26s might go into a spin if you put them in a steep back and uh, even the uh, even the old timers there uh, handled the ship with a great deal of care. And at the time that I was in at McGill Field, uh, there were a number of accidents. We would we would be flying along and coming close to the field, and we'd see the, a lot of black smoke coming up. And uh, we knew then that a B-26 had crashed. And at one time, I figured that um, that as many B-26s went down while I was in training there as did for a, an equivalent time in combat. So uh, everybody was very uneasy. Uh, at that time, I was flying as a co-pilot, and uh, we uh, we we uh, finished training at, at in McDill Field and went on to uh, Myrtle Beach, North Carolina. North Carolina, I guess. It is. And uh, there uh, we uh, continued training. And uh, one time we uh, went on, we were going on a cross-country uh, uh, trip in formation, four, four planes. Uh, the leader of the first uh, airplane was the squadron commander who was a West Point captain and I was flying as his co-pilot. We, uh, we flew down to, uh, we flew south from uh, uh, North Carolina to uh, uh, a field in Georgia, turned around there and headed back. And at this time the, uh, the uh, air was getting very rough and it was getting uh, visibility was getting poor, but we continued on and toward uh, uh, toward a, a uh, our field back in uh, North Carolina. But uh, after a while, we found out that uh, we were lost. We came to the uh, the coast and uh, uh, could see no visible landmarks that we knew. And uh, we were trying to uh, use our radio and to uh, uh, get some uh, navigational help, and uh, that that was uh, so uh, full of static that we couldn't hear much of anything. So we still had our four planes in formation, 
Did you have communication between the planes? Yes, we had uh, communication between the planes, and there was a, uh, let's see, a co-pilot and pilot and co-pilot, navigator, bombardier in each plane, plus there were uh, a couple of others in a couple of other planes. Altogether, there were 20, I think 24 people in the four bombers, and uh, uh, the weather was getting poor. We couldn't see very well. Uh, we headed back into uh, uh, to land, and at this point, uh, the little red lights were on that uh, told us we were near running out of gas. And so we had kept uh, looking and trying to find uh, some kind of landmarks that we could recognize, and not able to do that. Finally, uh, the uh, the captain, who was the commander of the uh, formation, uh, told everybody, told the other ships to break formation and to uh, bail out. So uh, they they disappeared, and our people bailed out, and I was the next to the last person to bail out as the as the co-pilot. And I, when I got to the bomb bay to get out, I could see the engineer down there uh, uh, making hesitating two or three times. He looked up and he saw me and then he dove out. <laughs> so uh, I went out and uh, counted my, uh, for the, I guess, 1,001 to uh, 1,005, opened my parachute, <coughs> uh, came down. It was, uh, this time it was uh, just uh, getting dark and uh, uh, I felt as though I was still fairly far above the ground and suddenly I see the trees coming up and at that time a gust of wind hit me and uh, I went sideways and uh, hit the ground at an angle and uh, there was a loud snap and <coughs> like uh, breaking a, a stick over your knee and I had an idea that it was my leg. and. I moved around a little bit, found out that it was, I could, it was hurting. So uh, I uh, wrapped the parachute around me. It was a swampy area with small trees and uh, spent the night there, sleeping part of the time and part of the time not. And the next day uh, I woke up and uh, a deer approached me and stood about 10 feet away and watched me and then slowly jumped off into the woods. At about noontime, I heard a, a motor and uh, I pulled myself up by a small tree there on one leg and uh, got my parachute ready to wave and a, a small Piper Cub type plane came over very <coughs> low over the trees and he opened the side door, leaned out and he said, I'll be back. And uh, so a couple of hours later, uh, <clears throat> uh, some people came in with a stretcher and, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'll you that water there. Okay. And <coughs> so they hauled me out <coughs> and uh, took me to a to a uh, army hospital at Camp Davis, North Carolina. There I found uh, most of the others uh, were there with various injuries, but uh, mine was the worst. There was one, uh, one the navigator who had a, a broken ankle, and then others who were scratched up and so forth. But um, uh, the uh, the uh, West Point captain was not in the hospital, <coughs> and I never never learned what happened to him. Uh, I presume that he got through it all right, and I also presume that he got chewed out when he got when he got better, because there were four planes lost that day. And uh, in any event, um, uh, everyone uh, gradually left the hospital and the last one to leave before me was a 
with the navigator with a broken ankle who uh, uh, met a nurse while he was there and got engaged and uh, then had to leave. Um, I left there and uh, I was uh, grounded through Washington so I couldn't fly and they sent me to uh, uh, an army field where uh, they put me in charge of um, uh, their small fleet of, of, uh, of uh, surveillance planes and uh, I was there a while. I didn't have very much to do except uh, <clears throat> sign a few papers. There was a, a sergeant there who uh, did all of the work and told me what to do and that was it and I would usually go swimming in the afternoon over the beach. Uh, and then I, uh, after um, uh, three or four months, uh, I finally got tired of, uh, of uh, lazy life and uh, I got hold of a flight surgeon and, and told him that I, to see what he could call Washington and find out what's going on while I was still grounded. And so then uh, I uh, <clears throat> got cleared for flying from Washington and got an assignment. They sent me back to uh, Myrtle Beach and uh, I then uh, flew B-26s uh, there for uh, uh, a couple of months and suddenly got orders to uh, go to uh, Smyrna, Tennessee for uh, uh, B-24, B-24 uh, 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 flying. Uh, and uh, I was there, I guess, three weeks or so, uh, being checked out on a B-24, and then was sent to uh, to uh, Tucson, Arizona, where the 459th Bomb Group was then uh, forming. Uh, uh, the, 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 the weather in Tucson was very clear, it was hot, uncomfortable, but uh, uh, we flew all, we did a lot of, we had an opportunity to do a lot of flying because the weather's was so good, but the uh, B-24s were then in short supply, and so we, uh, we didn't get as much flying as we might have. From, uh, from Tucson, Arizona, the group moved uh, to, uh, Westover Field, Massachusetts, where, where uh, we got lots more planes to fly, but where the weather was poor, very poor and a lot of rain, and we didn't get too much flying there. Uh, but we did uh, get enough to, uh, to uh, get our training up. And Could you compare a little bit uh the B-24 and the B-26, how they handled differently, and yeah. I know one was two inch and the other four. Yeah, but. okay, that's <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, when I was at, uh, when I went to uh, Smyrna, Tennessee, uh, and, I, and I saw those big lumbering four-engine planes, uh, boy, I thought they, they, were, they were very clumsy looking, but uh, as soon as I got in one, uh, I found that all of the pilots were uh, very confident flying it, and uh, whereas in B-26s, if you were shooting landings and takeoffs, uh, you would land the plane, then everyone would get out, and the pilot and co-pilot and the engineer would go over the plane very carefully. Then when they found everything was okay, they would get back and, and take off. In the B-24s, we came in and we landed, and as soon as the wheels were on the ground, we'd put a give it full throttle and off we'd go again. And the uh, B-24s were, uh, uh, the pilots handled them uh, easily and wouldn't mind uh, putting them into a steep uh, bank when they wanted to change directions. So uh, uh, I like the B-24s very much. And uh, although I've heard a lot of complaints about them being uh, difficult to fly uh, compared with the B-17, but uh, I liked the B-24 and was uh, 
quite satisfied with it all through uh, the time that I flew it. Um, at Westover Field, uh, we uh, continued uh, our training and uh, began doing uh, uh, instrument work. And I live uh, since I lived over in Albany. I one time came over in the B-24 and, and uh, uh, flew over my house at Del Mar. My mother was out hanging wash on the line and waving a sheet at me. And then I went down to the school and uh, I was careful not to get too low. Uh, and uh, I went, but I did go over the school and uh, let them hear some engines. And uh, later, the, later, they told me that I was below the flagpole, which of course I wasn't. <laughs> I, w I was a little careful because I didn't want anything to get back to Westover Field. Anyway, um, we finished our training at Westover Field and uh, uh, the, uh, to go back a little bit, at Tucson, I don't remember any, uh, any crashes there at all of B-24s. And at Westover Field, uh, we had very little trouble. Uh, I believe that uh, one plane uh, 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 went out and didn't find its way back. Am I running uh, too long? Uh, but uh, and we, fin we finished at Westover Field and then went down to uh, um, uh, New York City. Uh, what field is that? Uh, well, anyway, uh, uh, we went to there for the staging area, and uh, we were there, I suppose, uh, a week or two, uh, getting our papers in order, and then, uh, and we were we had to uh, fly to our overseas destination, which we didn't know at that time, and uh, we were we. Uh, took off singly uh, in B-24s, uh, uh, one plane at a time, and uh, <coughs> when I took off I had uh, my, a crew of, of ten, uh, which was the co-pilot, co-pilot, uh, navigator, bombardier, uh, waist gunners, and tail gunner. And well, anyway, there were ten of us, and uh, we took off one morning for. Uh, we knew we were going to uh, a field in Florida that that day, and there there we were going to receive uh, further orders, and we uh, so we flew down to Florida and landed there, and uh, uh, received sealed orders, and that we. Uh, had to open only after we were on the open ocean beyond the boundaries of the United States. Uh, and they apparently did this for uh, security reasons. And, uh, and that's also why apparently we flew uh, one by one. Uh, so it, it took the group uh, a long time to get overseas because they were going one one plane at a time, and uh, I think it took um, uh, me eleven or twelve days to go overseas. Uh, well, anyway, we uh, when we left Florida and got over past the uh, uh, the continental the United States uh, out of the water, we opened our orders, and it said we are going to, uh, let's see, oh, we, well, we went to, uh, I guess we, I think the order said we were going to Udna. We didn't know where Udna was. But anyway, we knew where our next destination was, which is uh, uh, one of the islands in the, uh, in the um, uh, Caribbean. Uh, it, uh, I can't forget the. I can't remember the name of the island right now, uh, but uh, then from there we went to uh, 
uh, Trinidad, and from Trinidad we went two or three hops and ended up at, at, at Belém, uh, Brazil, which is uh, on the bulge of the Brazil and is closest to Africa. So at uh, this time we began to think possibly we were going to Africa. Uh, we did go uh, then from Belém, we flew, uh, we had in addition to my regular crew of 10, we had uh, four others with us and uh, we, uh, um, four, four other uh, people flying with us, uh, part of the uh, operations officer and uh, uh, I think three others. The uh, rest of the uh, the rest of the group, all of the ground crews, uh, went by uh, ship, and uh, took quite a long time to get over there, which was they went over to Italy, and to get back to our trip, uh, we flew over from Belém to uh, uh, Natal or Fortaleza, North. Well, I think Africa anyway and uh, then we had about three or four stops uh, in Africa before we flew to Italy and uh, uh, where we were uh, stationed at uh, Sharignola. When did you arrive there? Uh, when did I arrive there? Let's see. Where was it? Where did Whoa, 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 whoa. January, huh? Let's see. Uh, I have it all down someplace, but. Uh, <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, in 40, uh, that would be 43, 44, I believe. Uh, early 44. Okay. I give you the. Mm -hmm. I have the information in my case if you should want to know. Uh, <clears throat> and at that point, uh, a lot of the planes had arrived in, in uh, Sherry Nolan, some were still on their way. And as a matter of fact, uh, we lost um, four B-24s uh, on the way over that just disappeared. Uh, no, no one knew what happened to them. and they. There was no radio communication from them or not. So what, what happened, whether they got in storms or what, I don't know. Um, the, uh, and then there were a, f uh, other, a few other planes that uh, had problems along the way on, on uh, uh, takeoff or, or landings and were damaged. But anyway, we got over to uh, Italy and uh, near Foggia, Sharignola, and there were a number of uh, uh, groups that were flying from that area. Uh, ours was the 459th, and I think there were, I don't know how many other groups, maybe about eight or ten B-24 groups and a few B-17 groups and some fighter groups. And uh, so, uh, we did some practice flying over there and uh, found out that we were not doing so well. And I remember one time we were on a practice flight and uh, uh, whoever was leading was going too slowly and uh, a lot of the planes were stalling out and dropping in the air and there was mass confusion. So. Uh, they wouldn't let us go on uh, any uh, missions until we straightened that out. Uh, we began to uh, fly our missions and uh, we uh, were uh, occupying an orchard, um, a grape orchard there where they made wine uh, that uh, was taken over, <coughs> was taken over by the Germans and they had uh, made the runway that we were using and uh, then when they departed 
we took over the runway. Okay, we're going to stop here and go to another tape. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, I'll start a little bit earlier than that. Uh, the, uh, the last, the, my last mission, the 50th mission, was uh, to uh, Budapest, Hungary, where we were bombing the marshalling yards there. Uh, after we uh, had our run at the target, the flak was very fierce, and the fighters were uh, making runs at us, German fighters. Uh, as we made our left bank off of the target, uh, I suddenly, my plane felt as though it had hit a, uh, uh, hit brakes or something because it dropped quickly behind the rest of the formation and uh, found that I was losing altitude quickly and the uh, engines were revving up and revving down and making a lot of noise and uh, uh, as we kept dropping down we had to feather two engines and the uh, third and fourth engines were running roughly but we were getting some power out of them but we were losing altitude at a fast rate and uh, along the, at, at that time I decided that if we were still losing altitude fast at around 9,000 feet, I would uh, let the crew know, uh, give the uh, bailout signal for the crew so that they all would be able to get out of the ship. Um, I did give that signal finally and uh, uh, heard that everybody was bailed out except the co-pilot and I and the then I told the co-pilot to leave and I waited a few minutes and then uh, uh, went back to the open bomb bay and dropped through. Uh, pulled the cord on the parachute and it opened. It was a beautiful day and uh, I was just uh, rocking back and forth in a light breeze and, and uh, looking at the scenery. I could see the plane uh, veering off at, at an angle and dropping and uh, then uh, uh, I began to realize that there were when I looked down that there were uh, a lot of figures down in the field approaching the spot where it looked like I was be falling to and uh, I uh, hit the ground fortunately didn't break my leg this time and uh, dropped into a uh, field of about uh, uh, 18 inches of uh, grass, uh, pulled the parachute under me and just lay there and then after a few minutes I began to hear voices. I looked up and uh, I was surrounded by about uh, 18 or 20 people in various forms of dress and some carrying shotguns and hoes and uh, um, other other uh, other uh, um, arms, and uh, they uh, led me away to a farm where uh, the uh, person uh, came out of the main house, who was apparently the owner of the farm. Uh, uh, he was dressed in a in a white short sleeve uh, uh, shirt and white pants and he was carrying a gun and uh, when he saw me he uh, uh, began to shout <coughs> 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 began to shout murder, bandit, and so forth, and uh, swung his gun uh, at my head, and I put my arms up and, and uh, took it on my arms, and, uh, and he shouted a few more things, and then they uh, led me away to a, uh, apparently a military prison on a uh, military 
uh, grounds in uh, south of uh, Budapest somewhere, and they locked me up in a uh, barred room and uh, with a uh, wooden platform for a bed. And uh, there I stayed for several days, uh, passing the time watching a spider catching flies and other things, and also looking out of a small barred window and I could see uh, groups of, uh, of uh, soldiers marching uh, to a bugle and uh, doing goose steps occasionally. Uh, while I was in that little prison, uh, they let me out and I saw some of the other people who were imprisoned uh, there, flyers, <clears throat> one of whom was uh, a uh, uh, fellow, young fellow with dark hair. His name was Russo. He was Italian and the, uh, the uh, uh, guards were uh, asking other prisoners and pointing to him and saying, Juden, Juden, and uh, he would say, no, 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 Italiano, Italiano. Anyway, uh, they were obviously fixated on uh, <clears throat> finding, uh, uh, looking for um, Jewish prisoners. And uh, found, they took us up to uh, the, um, from there we were taken to the uh, Budapest city prison where I was put in a cell with um, a slop pail on the corner, uh, on the, in the corner. And uh, there also I saw a, a number of, uh, of uh, prisoners with uh, large stars of David on their, uh, what, their prison uniforms and uh, they obviously prisoners and uh, maltreated. And uh, from uh, there, they uh, took us by uh, what they call a cattle car. They're, they, I think they're four and six cattle gear cars. I believe they could carry 46 uh, uh, cattle in them. And uh, they were like uh, box cars, but, but with um, uh, with openings in them, <clears throat> and uh, we were taken to uh, northern Germany to uh, Sagan, Stalagluft three, Sta Sagan, which was uh, originally part of Poland, and the Germans uh, became bar part of Germany after Germany. Uh, attacked Poland and uh, after the war it was returned to Poland. Uh, Stalagluf III was a, an air, air Force officers camp. There were several of them in that area and uh, it was a, a large uh, compound um, surrounded by barbed wire and fence and uh, guard towers at uh, intervals along the fence. And uh, there were many, uh, many uh, barracks there, which there were uh, um, hundreds of uh, prisoners of war in the, ba in the barracks. Uh, the, uh, in, in the inside the barracks were formed into uh, uh, communes in which uh, there were, uh, they were divided off by triple-decker bunks into kind of rooms in which uh, 10 to 12 uh, prisoners to one of these rooms and uh, uh, 
In the camp, we had uh, we had uh, news every uh, late every afternoon or evening, and uh, the news was from uh, we 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 did receive uh, German news, uh, but we also received American news, and uh, the American news came from a radio that was that the uh, our own the, the POWs had in the, within the camp that the Germans didn't know about and uh, <clears throat> one uh, one person from each from each barracks would go to a certain other barracks where they would meet and uh, someone would read the news the american news that came from the radio and which differed uh, uh, a great deal from what the German news was. Uh, uh, we knew a little bit more what was going on in the war because the uh, German news uh, uh, only talked about their great victories. And uh, so uh, the uh, person would uh, read the news and uh, they would post uh, Post uh, other POWs at the uh, op at the doors of the barracks, so that if the, any German guards appeared, they would yet yell "Tally ho!" Tally ho was the word that were, meant that there are guards approach German guards approaching, and uh, so they would read the news. If uh, if the German guards appeared, they'd yell "Tally ho!" The the uh, person who was reading the news would and the rep other people would leave and uh, the uh, Germans never did apparently find uh, where where the news was how we were getting the news and uh, and apparently uh, the, uh, the the radio or parts thereof were uh, brought into camp and maybe maybe guards were bribed or possibly and uh, so we did get our, our news that way. And uh, also while I was at that camp, uh, there were people who were, <coughs> <coughs> this, was a, this is the same camp where the uh, so-called great escape occurred. And uh, <coughs> this was where uh, uh, mainly, <coughs> mainly, <coughs> <coughs> Mainly, uh, British prisoners took part in that uh, the great escape, uh, digging a tunnel. Thanks. Uh, they dug, dig, dug a tunnel from uh, one of the barracks uh, outside underground, all the way over past the uh, the uh, the barbed wire fence. And then came out some distance, came out some distance away, and I, um, uh, I think about 50 uh, prisoners of war escaped through that tunnel, and and got out, but um, eventually, all but I think two, very two of them I believe, uh, escaped completely. The rest of them were all caught. In, in Germany or along the way and uh, executed. So uh, they were still digging tunnels while I was there, uh, but uh, no one no one no one escaped while I was there. Uh, and in fact the uh, <clears throat> the commanding officer of the compound that we were in was a, uh, a colonel. And uh, we received our orders from from him, and uh, we were told uh, we were not allowed to escape, try to escape, unless we got a plan and was and the plan was passed by the uh, commanding officer of the camp. Uh, obvious reasons uh, they didn't want uh, people. Uh, making poor attempts to escape and, and uh, getting uh, shot. 
or injured. Uh, there were people, there were uh, tunnels being built while I was there, and they would, uh, in the barracks, there was a, a place where there was a stove in the middle of the barracks, and the stove was on a, a concrete base which went down to the ground uh, under the barracks or a crawl space and the German guards often uh, uh, used the crawl space to, to uh, try to uh, see if anybody was trying to make tunnels to escape but uh, they were in this one place where they were building the tunnel they uh, fixed the stove so it could be pushed aside and then they hollowed out through the through the smack so that they could down to get down to the ground and then they uh, uh, dug a dug a tunnel and uh, of course in digging a tunnel you get a lot of dirt <coughs> that you got to get rid of because if the Germans see the fresh dirt on the, on the ground they know that something's going on and they were always looking for uh, people trying to escape so uh, the uh, prisoners would uh, fill up their pockets full of dirt and then they go out and walk on, on the uh, around the compound and and uh, surreptitiously throw a little dirt out here and there so it wasn't very obvious uh, they uh, the, the, the tunnels were really uh, uh, masterpieces uh, they uh, they 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 walled or the, the seat, they walled the tunnels with boards taken from from the beds, and uh, they had a uh, a system where they could uh, pump air down, and uh, so it was a really uh, a uh, pretty uh, clever endeavor. Were you ever involved in any of the digging? No, no. They were just uh, a certain. Uh, only those I think in the in the barracks uh, that were where they were doing it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Could you explain the barter system? Pardon me? That barter system you were talking about from the Red Cross with the chocolates and the... Oh yeah. Uh, well for uh, uh, for food uh, food there the camp was very scarce what the Germans gave us. The Germans would provide us with uh, uh, a soupy, uh, um, let's see it wasn't oatmeal, it was, um, what do they, what do they call them, well, anyway, a, uh, a, a kind of a gruel, uh, sometimes uh, uh, very watery soup, or else they would give us this uh, uh, gruel, a little bit like oatmeal, but uh, what is the name of that? Well, anyway, uh, so we would we would get a, a large uh, container of this uh, in the morning, and uh, then once in a while we would also get some uh, German bread, brot. It was very dark bread and uh, very hard and. Uh, uh, kind of sawdusty, it, um, but it tasted good for to us. Uh, we would get uh, a half a loaf, I think, for our each combine, which was about twelve prisoner of war, and uh, which meant we usually got uh, one very thin slice a day of bread, and then this uh, whatever this watery soup or whatever it was. Uh, we didn't get very much of anything else from the Germans, but uh, when the Red Cross packages came, we would get um, one pack, a Red Cross package, for each prisoner of war a week. And uh, the Red Cross packages had, uh, well, they would have a tin of, uh, of uh, spam and uh, some very hard crackers and uh, various other things in them um, and uh, <clears throat> we, we would mostly not 
eat the Red Cross package stuff the way it came in the package, but we would make other things out of them. They, uh, the prisoners would grind up the crackers and uh, mix other things with them, sugar and what other chocolate if they had it, and they would make it into a, uh, make them into cakes and uh, also make them into a pie crust and uh, fill them full of various things for desserts. Uh, and they were, uh, the prisoners also, uh, we, we, one of the, one of the uh, things that we got in the Red Cross package was a uh, can of, uh, of uh, milk, uh, dehydrated milk or powdered milk. And it was called uh, Clem, Clem was the name of the milk. It came in large um, tin containers and uh, the prisoners would take these Clem cans and uh, cut them up, uh, flatten up the, uh, the tin, and uh, then, then uh, uh, fit several cans together uh, with, uh, with tin strips so that they wouldn't leak, and then use them for cooking pans. Uh, and they uh, had a lot of other ingenious uh, things. They also would uh, make, take large cans and uh, a, uh, put a handle with a, a fan, make a fan that you could uh, turn a handle that would uh, uh, make a fan and you could build a small fire in there and then cook something on it. Um, at the camp we had uh, uh, we had a, a, a library that was uh, from books provided by the Red Cross. Uh, there were some musical instruments brought in and uh, the prisoners formed a band and we would have uh, band concerts now and then uh, with other, other kind of entertainment that the prisoners would uh, do. We, uh, <clears throat> we had, at, at first we had one Red Cross package a week per prisoner. The, the Red Cross packages also had cigarettes in them and D bars, which were chocolate bars. And uh, when, uh, when the war uh, get going bad for the Germans, our, our, uh, we were taken, given just a half a, a, half a, a uh, Red Cross package per person. And then uh, toward the end, we were not getting anything at all. But um, uh, the Red Cross packages, uh, enable us to have a barter system in which um, in which cigarettes were the was one one uh, exchange and uh, the chocolate bars were another so that uh, uh, at any given time depending upon the uh, number of cigarettes and the number of chocolate bars in the circulation while you might have uh, uh, 10 cigarettes equal to one D-bar, or it might go up or down. Uh, people bartered, uh, people uh, sold things, people uh, 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 sold chances on, on D-bars, and uh, in this way, uh, some uh, prisoners got to have, uh, became very wealthy, uh, in the number of D bars and the amount of food that they had and the number of cigarettes they had, uh, so uh, that was the uh, that system that we lived by there. How long were you there? Uh, I was there from uh, about ten months, from uh, the time I was shot. I shot down on July second, nineteen forty four. And uh, we, uh, well, uh, the, uh, the Russians were uh, 
uh, becoming, the Russian armed forces were beginning to uh, come near um, the uh, prison camp there at Sagan, and we could hear we could hear uh, artillery, and uh, sometimes uh, bombers going over. So uh, uh, one night we were rout rousted out by the Germans and uh, told that uh, about uh, I guess about our eight or nine o'clock at night, and uh, they told us they were. We had a, an hour to go back to our barracks and uh, take anything we wanted to take with us. Uh, and we would be going on a forest march. And uh, um, some, of the, some of the people, I went back and took only light things. We took, of course, uh, some of the food we could, we could carry, particularly any of anything that was portable um, and um, but otherwise I took what I wore and not too much else there were some people who made makeshift uh, wagons um, which didn't last very long as it turned out anyway we uh, we got out there and uh, they uh, lined us up and the German guards were around with uh, uh, with with um, guard dogs, all with guard dogs, and uh, uh, they, uh, they set the barracks afire, and uh, I can still remember there we were all standing around uh, in our uh, ragged uniforms, and, uh, and the barracks were burning, and uh, then they, uh, they marched us off, and uh, I don't know how many thousands there were of the, of the POWs, but we were marched along uh, roads and back roads, and um, uh, people began to uh, people began to the prisoners began to get tired, and and uh, as they did, they would drop off more possessions that they had carried with them, and. Uh, then we, we, as we marched along, uh, we marched all the next day, that night and all the next day, and um, we were, uh, the jar, guards would keep uh, telling us to keep moving, and so we didn't really know too much what was going on in front or in back, but we get rumors of those dropping behind where, uh, well, the, there were some rumors that they were being shot. Uh, whether that was true or not, I have no idea of knowing. Um, but anyway, we, uh, we went through, uh, walked, and the, uh, then the, after walking for the, all day, we, uh, it was uh, getting dark, and we stopped at a uh, church, uh, and we're told we could uh, sleep inside, and so we, uh, we went in, and uh, there were so many, so many POWs around that uh, finally the church, every every square inch of the church was full of little bodies, and they finally had to shut the doors, and the others had to stay outside. And it was kind of a, a cool night, and it was, uh, the uh, the floors were were uh, um, hard and cold. And anyway, we, we spent the night there, and uh, uh, let's see, that was a, uh, a Baptist church, I guess, then. Uh, and we went on and, and uh, walked the next day and stayed at a, in a brick factory the second night. And this time it was a large brick factory, and I think uh, I don't know how many got, got in there, but a uh, great number. And uh, then I think that, um, I think after that, that we, we walked more, and then they loaded us into uh, the boxcars, and we were had uh, 
so many, uh, so many of us were in a car that um, you could stand up all right, but when you tried to sit down, it was getting get kind of difficult. Although everybody managed to sit down after a while because they were tired, and uh, so they transported us from box cars down to a camp uh, called Stalag 7A near Mooseburg, which was in the vicinity of Munich. And uh, <clears throat> along the way, uh, I don't know how many days, well, how, how long it took, but it took, a, took quite a while, a couple of days at least in the, in the boxcars. Uh, every now and then they would let us out of the cars so we could uh, relieve ourselves. And I remember one particular place where they stopped the train and there were a lot of women and other uh, people around, but all these guys, the Kriegies, got out of the boxcars and dropped their pants and uh, <laughs> we were paying no attention to you. you uh, you had to move fast because you knew you were going to be back in there again and would not have an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> in Moosburg, it was very Stalag 7A, was a camp that was receiving prisoners from all over the place in Germany. And it was severely overcrowded and uh, poorly organized and uh, uh, Anyway, in any event, I don't even remember how long I was there, uh, perhaps a couple of weeks. And uh, one, morning, uh, one morning we got up and all the guards were gone. And uh, there were rumors that the, uh, the SS had come and, and uh, taken away the guards and shot them. Whether this is true, I don't know. Uh, and anyway, that, uh, we were liberated by um, General, um, um, oh, come on now. <laughs> uh, not, not Marshall, but um, old blood and guts. Oh, Pat. Huh? Pat. Yes, uh, George Patton, who, uh, who came into the camp striding along with a silver helmet on his head, on his, wearing a silver helmet with his uh, uh, stars on and wearing uh, kind of jodhpur, jodhpur uh, riding pants. And he came striding along with a whole bunch of tanks following him. <laughs> and uh, of course everybody was glad to see him. Uh, they were all crowded around yelling and uh, so forth. And uh, no sooner did the Americans uh, take over the camp, but they also closed it up and put guards around it where the Germans had previously had guards and uh, told us that we were restricted to camp until, we, they, uh, until they could move us. Well, uh, so, some of us decided we were gonna try to get out and we, uh, we got some uh, 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 wire cutters and we went and we cut a hole in the fence and uh, one of the GIs who was on on guard caught us at it but he let us go anyway we went out and we we went into town I'm not sure what the uh, the town was but it was but we were we went into town we were looking for food and uh, there were still occasional uh, gunfire you could hear, and apparently still some uh, uh, Germans left or German troops left. Uh, we went went around everything, but everything mostly was closed. We came to a large uh, building. It turned out it was a hospital. We rang a bell, and uh, the door opened, and it was a German colonel in full uniform, <laughs> and uh, we uh, we asked him if he had any food, and 
he said no, and we beat a hasty retreat because I suddenly realized that, uh, you know, what, what might happen if we got in the hospital. <laughs> and uh, we uh, never did get any food anyway. We returned to the camp, and uh, we were moved out of there and taken to, uh, I think it was Camp Lucky Strike in France, where uh, we stayed for a couple of days and then uh, went uh, uh, by a troop ship. We were taken back to the States on troop ships. And uh, subsequently, uh, I went on, I was given a leave of uh, a couple of months. And at the end of the leave, I was discharged. And, uh, and that was it. Were you ever aware of the uh, concentration camps? Uh, well, I was aware that they they had concentration camps, and I knew knew about that because I read about it before. Uh, many years later, as a matter of fact, about it was I guess it was about ten years ago. Uh, I belonged to a, uh, a former prisoner of war group. And they, uh, they returned, they had a trip back and returned to our former camp and returned to all the places we were, went on our march. And uh, also while we were there, we went to uh, uh, the Buchenwald there and uh, went in, uh, which was then uh, open to uh, open to visitors and uh, uh, oh. <sighs> well I uh, uh, saw the oven ovens and that sort of thing and, uh, really uh, even uh, even years later after it all was over it was uh, really a terrible thing to see and, uh, uh, you know, they had a, a uh, ovens there, and uh, uh, they had the barracks where the people were kept, and uh, we had a, we had a all trips, regular trip through the camp, and they had a lot of information there, and they, so forth, but, um, <clears throat> While we were over there, we also uh, went back to our Stalagloff tree, and uh, which is now woods. The only thing remaining there were a few bricks from a wall, but it all overgrown into woods. Otherwise, we went back um, to the uh, church where we had stayed that night, which is now, which now a, uh, I believe a Catholic church now instead of a, the other one. And uh, we went to a service and uh, we were met, met at the church with a lot of young girls with roses that they passed out to us. We went in and, and uh, they had a, uh, some kind of a sermon and uh, so forth. And uh, then we went from there to the visit of the brick factory. And uh, we went down to uh, the uh, to Munich where they had the Stalag 7A. And uh, we had a big banquet there uh, with some of the uh, Germans in uniform. And, uh, and the people uh, were very, well, very, we had a very nice time. Anyway, that was uh, a interesting to see it all from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you stop with this if we only have one minute? Okay, um, how would you say your war experiences affected your life? How it... Uh, um, in what ways? Did you well, I don't know. I uh, uh, well, I, I could tell you in one way. Uh, 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 
Well, while you were a prisoner, uh, and you were looked at and spat at, and uh, people uh, shouted and screamed at you, particularly uh, around uh, near the in Buda, around the Budapest area. These were people that we'd been bombing uh, and bombing a number of times, and uh, they were number very unhappy with us. They had apparently uh, heard propaganda that uh, the uh, American uh, air, the Air Corps, was filled full of gangsters, and uh, they had taken people out of the prisons, and uh, that we were uh, aiming to kill uh, uh, little children, and we we dropped uh, we dropped uh, uh, things that. Uh, looked like candy uh, that were actually exploded and, and uh, a lot of other things and uh, uh, aside from that all of these people had been bombed and uh, had many of their relatives killed and uh, uh, they were very unhappy with us although although sometimes in other circumstances um, when we were when we were doing our, our march uh, after uh, the Russians threatened uh, Stalingrad three, uh, we did meet some people along the way who were not hostile at all. And uh, uh, as for changing, I think that it uh, uh, it underlined to me that. Um, Sometimes it's on what side of the tracks you're on, uh, how you're regarded, and th that you uh, that you uh, can get into circumstances where you have little or no control over uh, what happens to you, mm -hmm. and you're uh, dependent on other people, and uh, what you thought was. Uh, uh, what you viewed at one wa at one way was uh, quite different from other people's viewpoints, um, and I guess that gives you a, a little bit uh, a broader broader outlook on life, and uh, and that you there are always several different ways of looking at things. Do you know what happened to the rest of your crew? Uh, well, the, um, the the part of my crew that had that had filled in mm -hmm. on another mission, uh, they all went home. The uh, the crew that were with me was the radio operator, engineer. It's the engineer. Uh, I think that's all of my original crew. Mm -hmm. Um, they uh, they all got out all right. Everyone everyone got out of my plane all right. As a matter of fact, that uh, I heard later that they said that um, somebody had counted uh, nine shoots going out of my plane. However, I was the tenth one. <laughs> but they told they told my reported to my family that. Uh, Apparently everybody got out, but uh, uh, they didn't see me, I guess. I was the last one. Uh, many years later, um, I was contacted by phone by um, my uh, waist gunner, who, uh, who had uh, subsequently joined uh, the 459th Bombardment Group Association along with uh, along with the engineer on the plane, and uh, they had met there, and then uh, he had managed to uh, uh, get my, t contact me through, he, he found a, a, a telephone book in the Albany area and saw a Mangus in there, which was my brother, and so he contacted me, and then I went to uh, one of the, uh, um, get-togethers 
and uh, so uh, my uh, engineer lives in uh, New uh, near New Orleans, and I visited him, his, him several times just last year. Uh, the uh, tail gunner is in California, and uh, I visited him, and we uh, uh, get in touch with each other by phone, by uh, letter. The, uh, the rest of the crew, uh, radio operator, uh, they suspect died and nobody could, they tried to locate him and they couldn't find him. This was many years after, of course. Uh, the, um, the navigator and uh, bombardier, uh, I, I uh, tried, I uh, uh, gave some, paid a search group to try to find them and they were unable to find them. And I had, uh, they, they had disappeared from their uh, other known addresses by the time I was looking for them. So I have no idea what happened to them. Uh, one of our other uh, crew members uh, died and his wife is now a member of that organization. And uh, uh, the rest of them are, I don't know, but we're Do you belong unable. to any veterans groups? Pardon? Do you, you belong to any veteran group? Uh, I don't belong to any veterans mm -hmm. group, no. I, uh, I never joined one and I was uh, uh, kind of interested in distancing myself from that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I did, uh, for a little while I was in the reserve, uh, but then kind of after a while I gave that up. And uh, so I actually had no contact with any any uh, veterans groups or until the, the uh, phone call, which was about uh, uh, I think about eight years, ten years ago, or eight years ago, when my uh, uh, waist gunner called me up. And uh, uh, now I'm just kind of sorry that I lost track of things, but. Um, you get home and you want to hear no more about <laughs> that sort of thing. Too bad. Did you get married when you returned uh, eventually? Or? Uh, not, yeah, not, uh, not right away. I had to, I was engaged uh, uh, during the, while I was off, but that didn't work out. And uh, then I uh, uh, got a job in New York City and uh, worked there a couple of years, and then I went out to a, I got a master's degree, and then I came back and worked in New York City a number of other years, and met somebody and married them there. And uh, so, that's about it. You have a family? I uh, have uh, four, uh, four boys who were all uh, uh, getting to close to, uh, the 50s, and uh, uh, and I'm uh, my wife died about um, uh, 15 years ago, and uh, I'm again remarried, mm -hmm. and uh, my current wife was uh, in the uh, army uh, and was in Germany, uh, stationed over there for a while, and. Uh, then she uh, eventually got out, and she's uh, about 15 years younger, so she was in a different era, not in the war. So anyway, that seems to be the, the... Do you have anything you want to add that you think you've uh, not covered? No, I, uh, uh, I think it was a, um, a, a great experience. Uh, one, I'm glad not to have a lot that's behind me, and that um, uh, I've never regretted any of it. Uh, uh, it's easy to say that when you survived it, you know, but, um, uh, and uh, had to, 
a lot of interesting experiences in prison camp and uh, I did a lot of reading. They, they had a, a library that the Red Cross had provided books for and I did a, little, a lot of reading there and uh, uh, came away with uh, uh, some different viewpoints that I had than, than what I had originally. And uh, uh, well, it was a very interesting experience. Well, thank you very much. Okay. That's on. Okay. Now, what is this? That's the uh, the flight record that that gives the number of hours that I flew, and what plane I flew, where I flew it, and what was the purpose of uh, the flight, whether it was. Uh, uh, formation pra uh -huh. or instrument flying or uh, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I guess that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. I I have uh, I told you I had written some stuff about. Oh yes, this, uh, and that is uh, s some stuff from the mainly the training days. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to write up the combat experience, and from there I go to the mm -hmm. POW stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, is this a copy for us? Huh? Or uh, is this your copy? No, that's my copy. Okay. If, if you would want to make a copy, you're welcome to. But uh, um, well, why don't we wait until your book comes out? Fine. <laughs> I, I don't want to take a manuscript of yours. That okay? No, I've I got it. I, well, I, yeah, if you want to take a copy, you would No, have no, I'd rather, if you're working on a manuscript, I'd rather not have your okay. manuscript until... And you said you might be interested in anything that... Uh, oh, I'll give you a quick, quick one. This is... Well, why don't you hold these up to the camera and explain them All right. with it held up to the camera. All right. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, the um, left to right were, were uh, uh, one of the two students of uh, the instructor Schlutt, who is the third person on the left, and uh, I'm the fourth person on the left. And this was uh, primary flight training at Douglas, Georgia. Uh, and uh, this this is uh, here I am, Roger Mangus, uh, standing uh, in front of the Stearman uh, PT-17 primary trainer at Douglas, Georgia. Uh, and uh, here I am in aviation cadet uniform. Uh, uh, here I am uh, as a first, second lieutenant, and uh, this picture was taken shortly after I bailed out of a B-26, and I have uh, a little caterpillar under my wings to show that. Mm -hmm. This is uh, me and my crew. Uh, the airplane is the BTO, which means big time operator. And uh, that's, that's the 10 man crew that uh, went overseas with me. Uh, we well, do not need to do any of these. Um, I would like to copy some of these things. Okay, though, uh, whatever you want. This, you might be interested in this. Well, this is the uh, telegram my folks got when, mm -hmm. and this is... Uh, I know this article is nice. You have a nice letter in there to your parents too, I see. This is uh, the, uh, at, at the uh, German POW identification. Oh. And uh, this, this is uh, another... Uh, Identity card for ex-prisoner of war. I don't know where that came from. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, yeah. Do 
you know where they have a copy machine here? Was this in the northern or central or? This was in uh, central Italy uh, on the uh, east side, fairly near the coast with the Adriatic Sea. Okay. And uh, the nearest large town was Foggia. And, and there were uh, quite a few, as I mentioned, quite a few groups that were flying from around there. And usually on missions, we would uh, uh, form with other groups and sometimes with the, the wing or the, or the whole Air Force that, that in Italy going to various targets. Um, we we uh, were staying, uh, as I said, on a, uh, a, what was a winery, and there were buildings where they made wine, and uh, I understand that uh, when they made wine, they, uh, the, the women took off their shoes and their socks and rolled up their pants and they crushed the grapes by walking around their bare feet. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't last into the fall when the winemaking season was, so I didn't see that, but I would have liked to. And uh, uh, in Italy, we stayed in, uh, we had uh, a square army tents that held about uh, eight, eight people. And, um, uh, we had a uh, an open air. Uh, um, uh, we ate we ate, ate in open air fashion. We had no dining room. We just ate outside with our GI kits, and uh, it was quite cold when we got there. <coughs> so we would uh, we made stoves out of uh, uh, metal metal drums and. Uh, uh, half drums uh, with a, a cut out place for an opening for you to get in there and then we would uh, run a, uh, a, uh, a fuel line from the, the stove to the outside where there was <coughs> a uh, container of, ga of uh, uh, airplane gasoline, high octane gasoline. and. Uh, there were some problems there. Every once in a while, one of the stoves would blow up, burn down the tents. But uh, it did was a way of heating the tents. Now, did you fly the same plane all the time? Uh, I well, we um, we were assigned. Uh, we got our own airplanes uh, for each crew in uh, at Westover Field, and uh, from then on, that was the plane that that my crew flew, and we flew it almost all of the time, but there were times uh, when other crews might fly it uh, because uh, shortage of airplanes and they needed. Now did you decorate and name your plane? Yes, uh, my plane was, uh, my plane was different from mo most of the planes were uh, named after uh, uh, females and usually had some uh, uh, pictures of uh, very statuesque females without very much clothes on them. <laughs> uh, we decided to be different and we named it uh, BTO for Big Time Operator. <laughs> and we had a, uh, a, uh, a wolf and a top hat drawn on the, or painted on the side of the plane, kind of a Walt Disney type wolf with his fangs and all. And uh, well, anyway, that was our plan. Did you did you have a jacket with the bat painted on it, or did you ever have a unit jacket? Uh, let's see. We had uh, yeah, we had a leather jacket, but not with. Uh, I think we just had our uh, 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 insignia on of some sort, uh, but we didn't. Uh, not I don't think anybody had any jackets with their plane's name painted on them, but the. Uh, Quite an interesting batch of, uh, of uh, planes and names. Um, 
let's see, what mess? Uh, we flew uh, we flew some missions in northern Italy, uh, particularly the Germans were uh, retreating there, and so we'd do some bombing uh, to uh, in coordination with the, the troops, and then we began to fly a lot into uh, Austria, Hungary, um, Germany, and uh, uh, various other places, and uh, many of them were uh, long trips. We'd have to get up at uh, about four o'clock in the morning, and uh, we'd go down to a, a briefing before we would uh, go off. They'd uh, uh, tell us what the mission was. They'd have a map and uh, would let us know what we might uh, encounter in the way of flak or fighters and uh, anything else that uh, they would brief the navigators, they would brief the bombardiers. And uh, after When you flew into Eastern Europe, I'm sorry, what were some of your targets? Well, there was, uh, let's see, Ploesti, Budapest, um, let's see, Bad Voslov, um, where else, um, <clears throat> well, let's see, um, we flew out also into, uh, over in Yugoslavia, through there, and, um, uh, we did a lot of bombing up in the, um, Austria and Germany and um, Hungary, Bulgaria. Were these mostly industrial targets that you were? A uh, lot of marshal railroad marshalling yards, uh, aircraft factories, um, and uh, uh, airfields, uh, and uh, others. But there were uh, particularly marshalling yards, and in Ploesti we. Uh, flew several missions, missions to Ploesti, and the 8th Air Force was also flying there. That was one of the, uh, well, it was one of the bad targets that, uh, uh, bad as far as uh, there was a lot of flak over the target, and uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, German fighters over the target, or on the way to the target. Um, so um, we we flew at that time. At that time, we got a credit for two missions for a long mission. Uh, so uh, I think that my total number of missions was 37. I believe uh, the count the count, uh, the count of the actual missions, but with the with the two credit, uh, I got up to 50. And uh, on my 50th mission, my, my crew had flown, had, uh, most of my crew had been, uh, had flown with another crew to fill in uh, on, on their last mission. And so uh, they, were, they were finished at 50 missions and uh, on my crew, the, myself and my engineer and uh, a radio operator were the only ones left that had the 50th to go and uh, that was some bad weather so we didn't fly for several days but then we flew a 50 this mission and uh, with part of my crew and part of a fill-in crew and uh, we flew uh, uh, Budapest the marshalling yards there and uh, uh, we uh, went on our bomb run and dropped our bombs and uh, as we were we were flying in a, a formation and then a group and as we were uh, banking away from after we had dropped our bombs uh, suddenly my plane got hit with flak and it was as if somebody jammed on the brakes and suddenly uh, the whole group was going ahead and my plane was dropping back and uh, dropping back and dropping down, uh, the, uh, the, uh, at that time I wasn't sure what was happening, but the 
instruments were the uh, instruments were showed that the uh, engines were were uh, uh, badly operating, and uh, we finally uh, two engines were flying very roughly, and we had to uh, um, feather the props, and uh, the remaining two engines uh, were not producing very well either, and we were losing altitude pretty fast and uh, when we were we, I think we had we were hit at about probably about 24,000 feet and uh, when I could see that uh, that we were dropping fast I made up my mind that uh, that uh, I would decide somewhere around 9,000 feet to whether to tell the crew to get out and so uh, at, at about 9,000 feet, we were still losing altitude fast. So, <clears throat> uh, so I gave the signal for the the crew to jump, and uh, uh, so uh, I was the last one out, and uh, the next to last was the co-pilot, and uh, so I just tried to keep the plane flying straight until the co-pilot co-pilot disappeared and then I uh, beat it to the bomb bay and, and dropped out and uh, it was uh, uh, the chute opened and uh, it was a beautiful sunny day and uh, the chute was up there above me and I was gently swaying back and forth and it kind of almost enjoying I should see the plane going like that in the distance and was it uh, on fire at all or uh, it was it was smoking mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't it was, there were no visible flames at that point <laughs> 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 <laughs>